So today we're going to finish up chapter 21 by talking about the last parts of the protist. So um, if you're looking in your book and you can flip to page 338, you're going to see that we're now going to be looking at the last two groups, the archaeoplastids and the epistocons, because we've already discussed the other ones. So um, we're going to run through these. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these um, because there's just a couple of things that I want to address. But I am going to suggest that you go through and you read these sections. Most of it's pretty straightforward, um, clear cut for you. So archaeoplastids, um, these have cellulose cell walls and um, chloroplasts. And um, they think that they or they they evolved from cyanobacteria. Um, through endosymbiosis. I remember we talked about that on the first um, unit, the first um, lecture. So there's two that I want to discuss. We're going to discuss red algae and then we're going to discuss green algae. So red algae is my favorite because this is what we use uh, for sushi. And so if you like sushi, uh, the sheets of seaweed that they use to wrap around it that we call nori, that's actually uh, red algae. So yum yum. Um, red algae is photosynthetic. Um, it's multi-celled, and we find it in clear, warm seas. Uh, when it grows, it grows as a sheet, um, and then uh, it has these little branching patterns. If you've ever looked at nori, you can kind of see um, that particular um, structure. So the reason why it is uh, red algae is because it has chlorophyll A, and then it also has red pigments. They're known as phycobilins. Um, this is important because its pigment um, constitution is what allows it to absorb blue-green light, which penetrates deeper in the water. And that allows red algae to live deeper than any of the other algae. So, you know, once again, it just kind of goes with how structure helps with function and how that function allows it to live in its environment. So this is what uh, red algae kind of looks like. Um, so you can see that it's, it's red. And uh, something interesting about it, This would be found in the Gulf of Mexico, and um, it's about 250 feet below the sea surface, which I think is, is pretty remarkable. One interesting thing about red algae is how it replicates and or how it grows, the life cycle. So if you look in your book on page 348, um, this picture will be found there. And it tells us, um, if you look at number one, it tells us that we have this sheet, and you can see that sheet right here on this picture. OK, so um, this sheet uh, forms uh, these little haploid gametes at the edges. And then um, those gamete, gametes uh, fertilize to form a zygote. And then that zygote grows into the spore forming body, which is diploid. And then it goes through meiosis and those spores that it makes are haploid and then it grows and eventually forms uh, that gamete forming body again, which is also haploid. So it does this cycle through haploid to diploid. Um, so that's on page 348 of your book. The other um type of archaeoplastid is green algae. And uh, green algae is uh, photosynthetic. It has chlorophyll A and B, which makes it, you know, the green. And um, we see a lot of different green algae that, that falls in this category. Um, there's green algae that lives just in freshwater, but there is some that lives in marine or saltwater. Um, it can be single-celled. It can live as a colony. And then there's they say seaweeds, but it's not really a seaweed. It's more of a, um, it's an algae. Um, but anyway, uh, land plants, they think, um, descended from this particular green seaweed known as caraphyte algae. And uh, some of the same structures like cell plate formation, the plasma desmata, those are seen in that algae, which are seen, of course, in our land plants as well. Um, one interesting fact the book talked about 
a green algae was what was used by Calvin, uh, Melvin Calvin, when he was studying the uh, light and dark reactions in photosynthesis. And I thought that was pretty good um, that, to know that that was used by it. And you can see some pictures here. Um, this is called sea lettuce. And it's, it's eaten by a lot of people. And um, so here's the non-modal single cells. And then this has formed a disc that have attached to something. And then the last thing are the amoebozoans and the epistochonts. So amoebozoans, if you see that word, you know, amoeba probably sticks out to you. And even if you don't know what an amoeba is, you probably at least have heard of one. Um, so amoebozoans are shapeshifters, meaning that they don't have a cell wall or a pellicle. So they kind of just, they're like blobs almost. They move around into different shapes. Um, the most common one of amoebozoans are the amoebas, and uh, most of them are predators, meaning they're heterotrophic, go out and attack things. And we find them in uh, freshwater habitats, but there are some that can be found marine. Uh, amoebas can cause some problems for humans. It's rare, but it can happen. Um, you may have studied in history class, you know, amoebic dysentery. That's where people would drink water that was contaminated with amoebas and the cysts that are formed by them causes some severe gastrointestinal problems. That's why we're told not to drink like standing fresh water because there's things that could be living in it that our body won't tolerate well. Um, a few years ago, there was an outbreak of an amoeba that people were getting from uh, warm fresh water like lakes. They were swimming in it and it went in through their sinuses and it got to their brain and caused some, some serious problems there. So, um, we just have to be careful. Um, you know, those, a lot of those places are studied. Like if you're going to a lake or something like that, a lot of places like that are studied, but, um, you just have to be careful about that. And there's even one that you can get. It mentions it in your book, but I can remember, um, someone telling me about this when I got contacts the first time. Um, if you don't sterilize your contacts correctly, you can actually get an amoeba in your, your eyes that could be pretty bad too. Um, the other amoebozoan are the slime molds. And slime molds are just really neat to me. Uh, they're, they're cool looking. And if you look in your book um, on page 350, you'll see a picture of a slime mold there. It's called the dog vomit slime mold, I guess because it looks like dog vomit. vomit. But um Cellular slime molds, they stay as like haploid amoeba-like cells, even though they're not really amoebas. Um, but then we have the plasmodial slime molds that can get huge. And uh, they do a, a neat way of uh, going through their, their life cycle. And I put that in your notes, but it's also on page 350. And I'm going to flip to it real quick. Uh, right here, it shows you how they actually go through um, reproduction, these cellular um, slime molds. So you can see on number one, they have cells, and those cells just go through mitosis. And then if food's not available, they begin to aggregate, which means they kind of spread out. And then they eventually form this thing called the slug. And uh, so some of it, the slug may immediately go into a fruiting body, and fruiting body means it's going to produce spores, but then some of them uh, may not. It may just kind of chill out. So anyway, so it'll go into this fruiting body and it forms like this, like almost like a stalk. And at the very top is where you find the spores. And when those spores are released, that's the new um, cells. And then it, you know, just continues the cycle again. But they're really cool. You would see these um walking through the woods. A lot of these are um, decomposers. They break down stuff for us. They, they feed on the organic matter, like on the, the forest floor. And so I know I've seen them before. Like if you find a, a log, you can kind of flip it over. Um, it's really easy to get them confused with a fungus um, because they, they look a lot like what you would think. Uh, you know, they look a lot like a fungi, but they don't have that typical mushroom shape to them. Okay, and so and this is your amoeba right here. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about are the epistochonts. And the epistochonts, this is a, a pretty big group. 
because it not only has protist in it, but it also has fungi and animals. Um, and so we're going to just real briefly talk about one type of protist that you would find in um, the Episthecons. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get into our chapter on fungi. So um, we're going to talk about the Koan Coanoflagellates, um, these are aquatic heterotrophic. Um, these are the closest known protestin relative of animals. And they kind of have this weird little shape. Um, this picture right here will show you. Uh, it, it looks almost like a sperm cell, but what's interesting is this little collar. That collar water sweeps across it and it pulls the food in and that's how it gets its nutrition. Uh, most of them live as single cells. However, they can go into a colony and that's what this is right here. And they stick together by like adhesive, um, proteins, these adhesion proteins, so it allows them to, to stick together. And, and that's really all we're going to talk about with the epistocons. Like I said, we'll, we'll briefly go back to them when we get to the, our unit on fungi. So that's going to wrap it up for 21. And, um, once again, you know, I just want to tell you, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, this is the first time that I've, I've taught this and, um, I've been, it was well, been a long time since I've had this and I've been learning right along with you. Um, I have enjoyed, you know, as I've been reading through, looking for videos and looking for articles that a lot of this um, in, is encompassed in. So I, I would highly suggest that you do some of that on your own, especially if you're not sure about some of the things that we've discussed in here. I've tried to stay true to the text for you, but I pulled in a few other things here or there. Also, um, you're going to be doing a research project soon. And that research project, um, each one of you is going to be given another protist or a different protist and you're going to be researching that protist and then you're going to share uh, with the class and to me via video um, about your protist. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and I will talk to you later.